COVID-19, naproxen, also known as Aleve, clotting, and viral growth, preliminary evidence. Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Masterjohn. I have a PhD in nutritional sciences. I am not a medical doctor, and none of this is medical advice. On April 22nd, in my email newsletter, I had first reported on the first large series of postmortem analyses that suggested blood clots within the small arteries of the lungs may be at the root of the COVID-19 hypoxemia, low blood oxygen. Since then, New York City doctors have reported strokes occurring in COVID-19 patients under the age of 50, including one as young as 33. This is consistent with the disease-causing blood clots, which are the major cause of stroke in Western countries. Hemorrhage in the brain can also be a cause of stroke. In my first article, I had warned against jumping to over-the-counter anti-inflammatory drugs to prevent blood clotting, as it is conceivable that they could promote viral growth. Quoting myself, It is important not to jump to conclusions here and use drugs with anti-clotting activity such as NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, to treat COVID-19 before we have more data. Such drugs can alter levels of prostaglandin E2 or PGE2, a substance that is involved in blood clotting, but which also can promote or inhibit viral growth depending on the virus. End quote. Now there is more research suggesting that naproxen, an NSAID often marketed as Aleve, actually inhibits viral growth. Since this is a medication, I want to emphasize my disclaimer again that I am delivering the research on the medication and my analysis for educational purposes. I'm not a medical doctor. This is not medical advice. Please do not make decisions on medication use based on what I'm offering here without discussing this with your doctor. Okay, background to the new paper. Naproxen was previously shown to inhibit the replication of influenza A, one of the causes of the flu, both in isolated cells and in live mice. This might partly be a result of its inhibition of cyclooxygenase, which produces PGE2, a substance that can sometimes promote viral growth, although as I noted before, sometimes uh, this can, sometimes PGE2 antagonizes viral growth, it depends on the virus. However, naproxen also binds to the N protein, which makes up the protein coating around the genetic material of the virus called the nucleocapsid and plays a number of roles in infection, the nucleocapsid does, including antagonizing the interferon response and facilitating the copying of the genetic material to allow replication. Naproxen binding to the N protein strongly inhibits the copying of the genetic material and as a consequence, strongly inhibits viral replication. The N protein of each virus is different, and so we cannot assume that its effect on the influenza N protein will translate to an effect on the N protein of SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. However, the new study sheds light on this. In the new study, computer modeling suggested that naproxen binds to the N protein of SARS-CoV-2 even better than it binds to that of influenza A. Then they tested the effect on viral replication in human cells that line the nose and the bronchus. So remember, on the one hand, the first finding is in silico, in computer modeling. It is weaker than in vitro evidence because they did not directly test the binding of naproxen to the end protein. They just predicted that it would bind based on the computer modeling. But this second finding is a actual finding in human cells showing actual replication of the virus. So they tested the cell the they tested the effect of on viral replication in, in human cells of the nose and those that line the bronchus. The bronchus is part of the lungs and constitute the air passages that connect the lungs to the windpipe. The nose could be taken as representative of the upper respiratory tract and the bronchial cells as representative of the lower respiratory tract. Strangely, naproxen strongly inhibited viral replication in the bronchial cells but not the nasal cells. 90 to 300 micromoles per liter or micromolar naproxen, a measure of the concentration of the drug, inhibited viral replication of the bronchial cells by about 75%. Neither concentration had a statistically significant effect on viral replication in nasal cells, but the replication was about 10% higher at 90 micromolar and a few percent lower at 300 micromolar. So 90 micromolar has a definite 75% reduction in viral replication in the lower respiratory tract, or at least in the bronchi- bronchial epithelial cells, but, uh, but it might have a slight increase in viral replication in the nasal cells. It's hard to say because there wasn't statistical significance. At 300 micromolar, you get the same 75% 
decrease in viral replication of the bronchial cells of the in the bronchial cells, um, and you get, if anything, a slight decrease in replication in the nasal cells. So 90 micromolar is probably net-net very beneficial, but 300 micromolar seems to have very clear benefit, uh, presuming this all translates into a live human. The virus replicates more quickly in the lower respiratory tract than the upper respiratory tract, so it may be the case that the effect of naproxen was easier to show in the bronchial cells because of a more severe level of infection. Alternatively, there could have been differences in the cellular response between the nasal cells or of the nasal cells and of the bronchial cells. We don't know what explains that difference. Is this likely to hold up in live humans? The basic way to test the likelihood of that is to see if the concentrations that inhibit the virus can be reached systemically by taking the drug as directed. In the bronchial, and one of the metrics that we would use for that is the IC50, which is the concentration required for 50% inhibition of viral replication. The IC50 in the bronchial cells was 46.07 micromolar naproxen. Two 220 milligram naproxen sodium tablets taken together lead to a maximal plasma concentration of 65.88 micrograms per milliliter, which translates into 286.12 micromolar. So this is very close to 300 micromolar achieved by two normal over-the-counter tablets of naproxen sodium. This is much higher than the IC50 and much higher than the concentration required for maximal effect. Remember, both 90 and 300 micromolar naproxen inhibited 75% viral replication, suggesting that maximal effect is already reached at 90 micromolar. This is getting very close to 300 micromolar. So you're well beyond the effect needed, um, the concentration needed for maximal effect. The half-life of naproxen is 12 to 17 hours. Generally, taking a dose once every half-life will result in an average plasma concentration that has roughly doubled a single dose on its own. This suggests that 220, naproxen sodium, 220 milligrams of naproxen sodium as one over-the-counter tablet taken twice a day separated by 12 hours would be the best way to maintain plasma concentrations very close to 300 micromolar. Now, remember that 300 micromolar was not needed for a 75% decrease in the viral replication of the bronchial cells, but it was... Um, it was the dose that also had at worst a neutral effect and at best a slight decrease in the viral replication of the nasal cells. At 90 micromolar, it was somewhat uncertain that there may have been a weak increase in viral replication of the nasal cells. So it would, you know, given the trade-off between a possible potential slight increase in the viral replication of nasal cells and a very powerful decrease in the bronchial cells, you're probably net-net getting benefit at 90 micromolar. But that's even, you know, it's it's much more clearly the case that you're net net benefit, benefiting at 300 micromolar. And that is what you get when you take the standard over the counter dose of one tablet twice a day every 12 hours. Now, this does not make it certain that naproxen would inhibit viral replication in live humans at those doses or at all, but it makes it very promising. Randomized controlled trials would be needed to test the effect. Now, what about blood clotting? Naproxen inhibits the cyclooxygenase 1 or COX-1 enzyme in platelets, which is ne necessary for clotting. This can be measured with a platelet function assay that, that passes blood through a membrane with small holes. The time the platelets take to close the holes is measured, and it's called the closure time. In humans, 250 milligrams taken twice a day increases closure time by 42%. So naproxen sodium has a significant effect in lowering clotting activity, suggesting that it would have an anti-clotting effect as well as having a, a antiviral effect. And um, both of those things seem positive in a disease where the virus might be causing its primary, um, its worst effects through causing blood clotting. Is naproxen safe? Well, it has a long list of potential side effects. You can look at a site such as the Mayo Clinic site or other online sites for a list of those side effects. I personally am concerned particularly about the potential of frequent use of NSAIDs to cause food intolerances and autoimmune issues because prostaglandin E2 or PGE2 uh, produced by COX-2 in the gut is necessary for immunological tolerance to foods, and because COX-2, although it plays a role in acute inflammation, also plays an important role in resolving acute inflammation, which stops acute inflammation from progressing to chronic inflammation. 
Obviously, in addition to all the foregoing, anything that has anti-clotting effects could risk excessive blood thinning in some people. So, for those reasons, please discuss any use of this or any other medication with your doctor to determine whether there's anything in your clinical history that would make it unsafe. With that said, naproxen has a history of widespread use as an over-the-counter medication and has a safety profile consistent with over-the-counter medications. This somewhat changes my position on NSAIDs. As I quoted myself at the beginning of this episode, my initial position was to warrant caution against NSAIDs blanket in a blanket manner, since their inhibition of COX enzymes and PGE2 production could inhibit viral growth in some viruses but promote viral growth in others. This new research removes my concern specifically for naproxen. It did not promote viral growth in nasal cells, and it strongly inhibited viral growth in bronchial cells. However, this study did not investigate the role of COX and PGE2 in this finding. Therefore, we do not know if it translates to other NSAIDs, which all share that mechanism of COX inhibition. In particular, the binding of naproxen to the end protein of the virus might be involved in the antiviral effect, and we do not know if any other NSAIDs bind the end protein in the same way. In other words, this at least shows that the inhibition of COX, because naproxen does inhibit COX, so it at least shows that the inhibition of COX does not generally favor viral growth. However, we don't know if that, if even that assumption, if even that conclusion is modified by the fact that naproxen binds to the end protein of the virus. We have no idea if any other NSAIDs bind the end protein in that way. So it could be the case that actually inhibition of COX is not good for viral growth, but naproxen binding to the end protein is so beneficial for, for or so be, uh, antagonistic to viral growth that it subsumes any potential um, net, uh, promotional effect of COX inhibition on viral growth. That could be the case. Um, so I remain cautious about all other NSAIDs, but I have specifically been relieved of my concern that naproxen um, would fall into the category of something that could promote viral growth. Naproxen is clearly in the category of something that inhibits viral growth. Bottom line, naproxen has not been shown to be beneficial for COVID-19. Randomized control trials would be needed to show that it is effective. However, Taken at standard over-the-counter doses, it strongly inhibits replication of the virus in bronchial cells, and it has anti-clotting effects on platelets. Given that clotting may underlie the hypoxemia and the rare but deeply concerning incidence of stroke in young people, these anti-clotting effects may help prevent the case from becoming severe or fatal. Over-the-counter medications are not zero-risk medications, but if something with a risk profile suitable to the use for a headache or a menstrual cramp also has the potential to prevent COVID-19 from becoming severe or fatal, many people may choose to use it. Personally, because I am concerned about the side effects of frequent use, I would only use it short term during an illness and I would not use it preventatively. Please do not take my advice when you when uh, using any medications without first discussing this with your doctor. More detailed disclaimer. I have a PhD in nutritional sciences. I am not a medical doctor. This is not medical advice. I am not an infectious disease epidemiologist. I am not speaking on behalf of their profession. I have a PhD in nutritional sciences. My expertise is in conducting and interpreting research related to my field. Please consult your physician before doing anything for prevention or treatment of COVID-19. Please seek the help of a physician immediately if you believe you have the disease. This series is based on my free daily newsletter, COVID-19 Research Updates. As a result of the time it takes to produce a video or podcast from a newsletter that I wrote up, there's a slight delay between when I publish the newsletter and when you watch or listen to this. When you subscribe to the newsletter, you get the latest in my research every single day as soon as it's ready to come out. You get references and links to the sources for all the information. You immediately get an archive of all the past issues. You can sign up at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash COVID-19 hyphen updates. It would mean the world to me if you would support this service by purchasing a copy of my ebook, The Food and Supplement Guide to the Coronavirus. The guide contains my most up-to-date conclusions about what we should be doing for a nutritional and herbal support on top of hygiene and social distancing for added protection. Due to the absence of randomized control trials testing nutritional or herbal preven- prevention, these are my best guesses for what is likely to work without significant risk of harm based on the existing science. Many people have asked me why I'm charging for this instead of giving it away for free, given that this is a time of crisis and people are in need. Unfortunately, I have not been immune to the effects this virus has had on the economy. My revenue for my other offerings started falling in February, and by mid-March, I had days where my revenue was zero. I have three people who work for me full-time, and I'm doing everything I can to avoid laying any of them off. 
By mid-March, I had depleted 75% of my emergency fund in order to avoid any layoffs, and without charging for the guide, I would not have been able to hold out much longer. Charging for the guide has allowed me to keep everyone working, replete some of my savings, and devote myself to researching COVID-19 full-time. As a result, I now publish this daily COVID-19 series in the free newsletter. I'm involved in the, de- in the design of several clinical trials that are in the process of being submitted for registration now, and I'm able to continually update the guide for free whenever my research warrants it. By purchasing the guide, you are enabling me to continue devoting my skills to the most important issue we now face. I'm genuinely grateful for your contribution. You can purchase a copy at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash coronavirus. Please note that as a result of the COVID-19 crisis and the time I'm committing to staying on top of relevant research, as well as the high volume of questions I receive, it may take me extra time to respond to questions. For an update, up-to-date list of where I respond to questions most quickly, please see the contact page on chrismasterjohnphd.com. Thank you and stay safe.